Good morning, brothers and sisters. Today we want to begin a very important section of our study of Christology, namely conciliar Christology. Conciliar Christology studies the various dogmatic statements and doctrinal teachings uh, that came up, especially in the face of the crisis, through the ecumenical councils. Let us invoke the help of our Blessed Mother that we may be truly uh, capable of understanding this mystery and through her inspiration, through her prayers, the Holy Spirit may illumine our minds and our hearts. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with you. Blessed are you amongst women and blessed is the fruit of your womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Mary, seat of wisdom, pray for us in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So, the explicit Christology of the Apostolic Church. We shall study the definitions, Christological teachings, and definitions of the seven ecumenical councils. Uh, and we shall begin this, we shall do it in different sessions. We shall first look at where the journey began. The journey began in the apostolic times, the apostles. Recall what St. Paul wrote. We preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles, but to those who are the called, both the Jews and the Greek, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. Notice the phrase, wisdom of God. We are going to look at it. Wisdom of God is the power of God and the wisdom of God. Who is that? Christ crucified. Christians were mocked, made fun of, because of their faith in Jesus as Lord and God. For instance, this caricature, which is found, which was found in Rome on the Palatine Hills, depicts a crucified man with the head of a donkey. It was intended to make a, a fun of the Christians. And the inscription says, Alexamenos, meaning a Greek man, a name of a Greek man, worships his God. His God is the one who cruci was crucified. Clearly, faith in Jesus as Lord and God existed right from the beginning. Another indication of this faith in Jesus as both human and as divine is found in the Aramaic hymn, the pre-Pauline Aramaic hymn that we have in the letter to the Philippians. What St. Paul did was to pick that hymn that was already being used in the Jerusalem, the Palestinian communities, and uh, translate it into Greek. And, the, and we are familiar with that. Though he was in the form of God, Jesus did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even death on a cross. Notice the two forms, the form of God and the human form. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, that in the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is, the, is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So, form of God, human form, God exalted him at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. Now, here we notice there are three stages uh, in, the, in the life of this particular person, Jesus. There is a pre-existence then the earthly life and the glorified state. And there are two substances, two forms, uh, morphine, he, Greek, 
in the earthly and glorified Jesus. Two natures, later the term would be two natures in Jesus. Now, in all the three stages, the identity, meaning the answer to the question, who is he, who is it, of Jesus is one and the same. He is the wisdom of God, he is the word of God, he is the image of the Father, he is the Son. Later, other vocabularies will emerge, especially the vocabulary of nature and person. As we shall see, we confess that in Jesus, there are two natures. Uh, he was truly, fully human. He was truly, fully divine. But there is only one person, the Word, the divine person of Jesus. Now, the question he was, uh, he pre-existed in the form of God, yes. But how to understand the pre-existence in the form of God? Now, same basic facts. Jews, as you know, are strictly monotheistic people. You cannot preach in Judaism two gods. Two gods. There is only one God. The Lord your God is one. And you shall not have any other gods besides me. And the one who is talked about as pre-existing is distinct or different from God who exalted him. Because we see God exalted him. The one who exalted him is distinct from the one who took flesh, who became a servant and dwelt among us. Jesus, in fact, had claimed an existence with the Father before he came to be born. And, uh, before Abraham was, I am. He claimed an existence much before he came to be born. Uh, all things have been delivered to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Matthew 11:27. Or no one has ever seen God, the only Son who is at the bosom of the Father, he has made him John, John 1, 18. The parable of the vineyard owner, the tenants who mistreated uh, the servants, and finally the son was sent by the owner, and they mistreated him, in fact killed him. It was a way of saying he was sent by God, the Father. And now they went to the Old Testament to see whether there is any prefiguration of someone who is existing side by side with God. And then they discovered, yes, in the book of Proverbs, chapter 8, verse 22 and following. There we read, The Lord created me at the beginning of his works. The Lord created me, what that is a way of saying God uh, and I was there at the beginning of his work. The first of his acts of long ago, ages ago, I was set up at the first, before the beginning of the earth. When there were no depths, I was brought forth. When there were no springs abound with water, before the mountain had been shaped, before the hills, I was brought forth. When he had not yet made uh, and fields of the world's first bits of soil, when he established the heavens, I was there, etc. So here, notice the writer says, God's wisdom exists before all creatures and works. The God's wisdom is with God. God possessed wisdom from the beginning. Now, notice the word possessed. And that beginning is a metaphysical beginning in the sense it is a way of saying God is the origin of wisdom. It is not God possessing wisdom sometime later. That would mean God initially did not have wisdom. Of course, that is a foolish statement. God always possessed the wisdom. And that wisdom God created, uh, meaning it was existing with God. God is the origin, the first person, the Trinity later would be say the origin. Now, in the wisdom of Solomon, chapter 722-29, we can notice that the wisdom 
as personal qualities. Let me uh, read some of the personal qualities of this wisdom. Uh, there is in her a spirit that is intelligent, holy, unique, manifold, subtle, mobile, clear, unpolluted, distinct, invulnerable, etc., etc. So the wisdom has qualities, personal qualities, it is not separate uh, uh, from God, is not another God, but is the wisdom of God. So St. Paul was able to say, Jesus, whom I proclaim, the Jesus crucified, is the power of God and the wisdom of God. The wisdom of God is incarnate, he is Jesus of Nazareth. So the reflection on wisdom was a key feature of the later in the testament of Judaism, meaning between the end of the Old Testament, last book, and the first book of the New Testament. Now, another term that the Christians appropriated from the Sophists is the term Logos. St. John used that term and called the Lord Jesus Logos. The beginning was the Word, the Word was with God. The beginning was the Logos, the Logos was with God, the Logos was God. Now, please don't read the term Logos as a, a word that we understand, but the actual meaning of Logos is an account, a narration of wisdom itself. Sophies had made an important distinction between the spoken or pronounced word, that is the Logos brought forth, and the word which still remains in your mind. When I say something, I communicate an idea, I uh, say it uh, using words, but that does not mean when I speak, the idea disappears from my mind. The idea still remains, and they use, and St. John uses that analogy or imagines that way. God, the second word of the second person of the Trinity, takes flesh without leaving the Father. He becomes one with us without leaving the Father. This distinction was useful for Christianity to communicate its faith. So, when do we produce, emit, or generate? with no loss to ourselves, it is when our thoughts are communicated. The mental word remains with us even after it is brought forth. Similarly, the word who is with the Father for all eternity is brought forth and then in time would become flesh. Now, Logos, the third image is Logos as an image, image itself. Imagine you are nothing but mind. Now think of the mind understanding itself. If you succeed in understanding yourself, the question is, will the concept you have in the mind match yourself and your only mind and you understand? And the answer is yes, you will match yourself. And that is what is brought into the letter to the Colossians. God is pure mind. His concept of himself is a perfect replica of himself. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. He is the reflection of God's glory and the exact imprint of God's very being. And then finally, from image to son. Uh, this is in the Hebrews. Long ago, the letter to the uh, Hebrews says, Long ago, God spoke to our ancestors in many and various ways by the prophets. But in these days, he has spoken to us by a son. Notice the term son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom he also created the walls. Hence, uh, in their search for uh, meaning, or uh, in their uh, attempt to understand their experience of Jesus as Lord and God, they went back to the Old Testament and discovered there is the wisdom of God who was with God from the beginning. And that wisdom of God is indeed the logos of God, the narration of God, the story of God. Uh, uh, and that logos of God is nothing else than the image, perfect replica of God, the Father. And that image 
or perfect replica of the Father is the Son of God. And hence, Jesus was clearly seen to be the Son who took flesh and dwelt among us. And there we shall stop. And in the second part of this, we shall now consider the journey towards Nicaea. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen.